All right. Okay, guys, we're going to start. Thanks. All right, good morning. I'm Linda Feldman, Washington Bureau Chief of the Christian Science Monitor. Our guest today is uh, Senator Steve Daines of Montana, Chair of the National Republican Senatorial Committee, and he's making his first appearance at a Monitor breakfast, so welcome. Um, we have a full house today, so I'll be brief. Senator Daines grew up in Bozeman, and Montana, and had a career in the private sector before he was elected to the House in 2012, and then the Senate in 2014, and took over as chair of the NRSC early this year, er, early last year, and is, and is on a mission, am I right, um, to usher his party back into the Senate majority, which is why we're all here, to, here today. So again, welcome. Um, now for the ground rules. We're on the record. Please, no live blogging or tweeting. In short, no filing of any kind while the breakfast is underway. And once uh, the session ends at 9.30, there's no more embargo. Um, as you all know, uh, if you'd like to ask a question, just wave at me and I'll call on as many of you as time permits. And um, just a note, since we have so many reporters, please, please just ask one question and hopefully we'll get everybody in and then maybe go to a second round if there's time. Now, um, Chairman Baines, if you'd like to make brief opening remarks, the floor is yours. Sure. No. Uh, good morning. Uh, Governor Dutton sends his greetings to all of you from Montana. You, know, you guys don't watch Yellowstone, it sounds like. <laughs> <laughs> says, the first question I get is, uh, how's Governor Dutton doing? But uh, it's, it, actually, that show is having an impact on our politics because uh, we're seeing a lot more refugees coming to Montana, missionaries, as we say, who are fleeing, we call them the cows. Uh, California, Oregon, and Washington are fleeing uh, these blue states and coming to states like Montana, and that is having an effect on, uh, on our politics back home. Anyways, but as the first, first Republican elected this seat, in a hundred years in Montana. I've been watching Montana politics for a long time. I grew up, my grandpa was a diehard Democrat, my grandpa Danes, who taught me how to hunt and fish. My dad was a Democrat early on. His politics shifted when he started construction business, but I'll leave it at that because I know you have a lot of questions to ask and Good. jump right in. I'm glad to be here. Glad to have an open Good. conversation. Well, thank you for coming in. And also, thank you for starting at 8.30 and not 7.30. We had uh, Rick Scott, your, your predecessor at NRSC, did a breakfast two years ago, but only on the condition that we start at 7.30. So, anyway, this is great. Um, it's kinder, gentler, I've seen how it goes. <laughs> so, so, I'll start with the big basic question. The odds are quite good that your party will take the majority. Not predicting anything here, but it's, I would rather be in your seat than the, your Democratic counterpart. Um, does having Donald Trump on the ballot help or hurt your cause? Well, it, uh, if you take a look at the states where uh, the U.S. Senate majorities will be decided and, and where the presidential electoral calls will be decided, it helps. Uh, look at, uh, start, start at the top in, in West Virginia. We worked hard across the board to find candidates that could not only win primary elections, but also win the general election. And uh, we started in West Virginia with um, recruiting uh, Governor Jim Justice in that race. Polls show that uh, he was beating uh, Senator Manchin by solid double digits. And this is a state that President Trump will win by 35 to 40 points based on the history of the last two elections. He moved next to a state like Montana, where President Trump will win by 15. To, uh, to 20 points based on the last two elections. Uh, and you know, John Tester has not been on the ballot with Donald Trump on the ballot. I experienced that in 2020, if you remember the, the big Senate race that I had in Montana. That was the most expensive political race in the history of the United States on a per vote basis. It was $210 million. I was outspent by $50 million. It was considered a toss-up race all the way to the end, uh, running against a very popular Democrat incumbent governor, Steve Bullock, whose favorabilities were north of plus 20 when he got in the race at the very end of March 2020, just before the filing deadline. And uh, on election night, there was a lot of surprises. We ended up winning 55-45 and we saw the effect of these, these Trump voters, who in many cases, some were lower propensity voters, who showed up 
that the pollsters weren't catching in their polling. They, uh, they, they would, they would uh, be classified as undecided voters, but what they really were saying is, I'm not telling you. And they showed up and they voted, of course, for President Trump. And while they were voting for President Trump, they came down ballot and also voted for me. And we surprised a lot of people on election night, though massively outspent. By the way, a $210 million race in Montana is like, uh, let's see, nearly a uh, you know, $2.5 billion race in Florida, to put that in perspective of the normal life of the population. So I know what it's like to be in a race with President Trump on the ballot, and certainly helped us. Then you go next to a place like Ohio, where uh, President Trump will win Ohio by six to 10 points. Latest polls have Trump up about 10 in Ohio. I mean, I'm talking polls that I trust and rely on and look at. I'm, I'm a chemical engineer by degree. I'm a numbers guy. And, um, and I, I look at this very quantitatively, because last time I checked, whoever gets the most votes wins. It's, right. it's about numbers. And um, if you look at Ohio in 2020, President Trump won Ohio with 53.3% of the vote. Interestingly, in 22, J.D. Vance won his race with 53.3% of the vote. What we're seeing in some of these particularly redder states, states that have moved more to the right, just from a um, political viewpoint and a voter viewpoint, there's increasingly less ticket splitting. It's becoming more of a red jersey, blue jersey exercise. We're seeing that in Montana. We're seeing that in uh, in Ohio. I mean, when I when I was elected, as I mentioned, in, in 14 to the United States Senate, uh, there was only one, only one statewide elected Republican in Montana. The rest were all Democrats. Today, there's only one statewide elected Democrat. The rest are all Republicans. And so with Trump on the ballot, I think it's, it's going to help a certain states. Then you go to um, the, the, you know, the blue wall, places like Wisconsin, Michigan, certainly in Pennsylvania, um, you know, we're seeing that, again, you have these lower propensity voters, oftentimes blue-collar voters, that are, uh, are very supportive of President Trump and are going to show up uh, in, in, uh, in November. In Ohio, uh, you look at the difference between a midterm and a presidential, there's about a one and a half to almost two million higher vote turnout in a presidential and that's going to be more, you know, the higher the turnout in, in these states, the better it's going to be for Republicans, which is kind of contrary to kind of the old school thinking was high turnout usually favored Democrats. High turnout many more in these states that are, that are more center right now uh, actually favors Republicans we see, and President Trump will be driving a lot of that. I need to go to Wisconsin, I mean, I can go through all these states, but anyway, bottom line is we see this, and, and, and can't forget that in 2016, you know, Trump won Wisconsin, he won Pennsylvania, he won Michigan, and he was the first one to do that since Ronald Reagan. All right, well, thank you. Yep. Um, so, Melissa, where's Melissa Oh, there you thank are. You. Uh, from the Detroit News. So I think, I think we're gonna hear about Michigan. Hi. Michigan. Michigan. Yeah. Um, I wanted to ask about uh, the primary there in Michigan. Uh, Sandy Penzler's campaign yesterday, he's the self-funding candidate yep. in the primary, um, made it clear he basically intends to kind of carpet bomb with ads through the primary and I hoped you could I could get your reaction to that and whether it would cause the committee to change or shift its plans in terms of kind of if and how much you spend to try to defend uh, Mike Rogers there. Yeah, you know that that uh, primary shifted dramatically when President Trump endorsed Mike Rogers. You look at the polling data, it gave Rogers an over 50 to 60 point boost in the primary once President Trump endorsed Mike Rogers. Um, I've been working very close with President Trump and his team since I first took over as chairman of the NRSC to, uh, to be aligned as we go through state by state. And as you see, you know, the president has, uh, with you know, collaboration with myself, working together to endorse candidates that not only can win primaries, but general elections. And Mike Rogers is yet another example of that. And so uh, I'm, I'm confident with the president's endorsement. And Mike Rogers is just a, he's a great candidate. You know, he's, he, of course, had uh, a great uh, time of service in the U.S. House, was chairman of the House Intelligence Committee. Mike and I overlapped in the House uh, when I was there. I was just in the House for one term. So I think, um, 
I think the Trump endorsement of Mike Rogers really seals the deal in that primary. Um, and by the way, in the general, if you look at that, it's, it's worth noting in that general, because that's an open seat, you know, you, when you start take a look at the map, when you look at the, look at the 24 map, the first thing you, you take a look at is, of course, the, the states, the red states, where Democrats have to defend seats. And that started with West Virginia, and then to Montana, and then Ohio, where in every one of those three states, every single statewide elected official is a Republican, except for Joe Manchin, John Tester, and Sherrod Brown. And states, of course, that Trump will win uh, by double digits, uh, certainly in, in West Virginia and Montana, and in Ohio it will be high singles, maybe double digits in, uh, in, in the fall. But you also look at open seats. Where are the open seats at? Well, West Virginia, but that overlaps as well with the red state. But then you go to a state like Michigan with Senator Stabenow's replacement. Uh, that, that race right now, I mean, depending on what poll, that, that's literally a dead heat. You see polls now 39, 39 kind of numbers, uh, roughly within margin. Uh, that race is still being defined because statewide, both counties still have some work to do to get their name IDs up. Uh, but keep in mind, Joe Biden is in, is in real trouble. I mean, probably to answer your question, too, I, the question I'd be asking is, more so is, is, what is, is, Donald, is Donald Trump going to help or hurt? I'd be asking the question, what's Joe Biden going to do for these candidates? I mean, when, when uh, President Trump was in Michigan last night, Mike Rogers is proud to stand on the stage with President Trump at that rally. I, I guarantee you Slotkin's going to have some real heartburn deciding whether or not she should be on the stage with Joe Biden when he comes to Michigan when you've got the situation happening in Dearborn right now, you've got the auto workers at the moment here who are furious about the EV mandates. You look at Ford lost $132,000 per EV sold in, first, in the first quarter. They wrote off over a billion dollars in losses in the first quarter because the, you know, these, these, the, EV, the problem they're having is selling EVs. You know, Ford Lightnings are just a disaster for Ford. The auto workers are, are furious with this administration and their mandates in terms of their, their green agenda. Uh, and so, consequently, um, I, again, I think Trump is going to be, you put Trump versus Biden, a state like Michigan, driving out a lot of turnout here of the blue collar workers who are, can't wait to show up and vote for, uh, for President Trump. Mm. Um, okay, now a Pennsylvania question. Jonathan Salant from the Pittsburgh Post Gazette. Thanks for doing this. Uh, energy hit in Pennsylvania. President Biden's proposed freeze on permitting new LNG plants, has uh, export plants, has caused a lot of answer, even among Democrats. The last two Sunday talk shows, both Governor Shapiro and then Congresswoman Lee had talked about it and expressed concern about it. How much is that going to be an issue this fall? Is that something that you and uh, the former are going to uh, emphasize? Yeah, well, I mean, it, it ties right back to, you know, the, the top two issues nationwide. If you, whether you're looking at Republicans, independents, or Democrats, boil down to what's happening on the southern border and inflation. These policies of the Biden administration uh, that the American people are watching, whether, whether it's uh, putting pauses, which really means trying to stop LNG permits. I mean, look, look, at, the, look at the White House website to do is it was stop LNG, stop fossil fuels. This is not a pause. Uh, that's political speak. They're trying to stop LNG, which does not make any sense because LNG is a way to actually reduce carbon emissions, low cost energy, and provide base load power. So I think it's a big issue, particularly state like Pennsylvania, but particularly states where we're competing. Energy is a big issue. But in Pennsylvania, Pennsylvanians want to see the development of their of their natural gas of their oil uh, because it's it's part of jobs, it's part of lower cost energy, it's part of energy security to decouple ourselves from, from the rest of the world uh, and dependence on places that are hostile to the United States. So I, I know, uh, you know both Dave McCormick and I will be talking a lot about that in Pennsylvania. Uh, Karen Tumulty from the Washington Post. Um, I'd like to ask you about the other side of the ledger for you, which is yeah. Maryland. Yeah. Mm. Um, in fact, the Democrats have made it clear that they plan to make control of the Senate, the main issue in this race. Yeah. And it was interesting because Chris Van Hollen uh, cited your race with Steve Bullock to me as evidence that a popular governor uh, can't overcome these, these sort of put on your team jersey forces. Yeah. Uh, 
how does Larry Hogan win with Donald Trump at the top of the ballot in Maryland? Well, just in fairness, let me push him back on what uh, the, the good senator said. Um, it was a it was a compliment to you. Yeah, yeah. Yes. Well, well, but it was it was uh, in fairness. Um, Steve Bullock, our government was running against a um, an incumbent U.S. senator right. who was you know had good numbers back home in Montana, uh, yeah. and it, it had been uh, both a right. a one-term House member as an at-large seat, so I've been elected statewide twice and had strong numbers coming into that race. So just in fairness, I think it's worth pointing that out. In terms, of, I'm not sure that's really a uh, a good comparison. Uh, we look at that, but uh, I mean, you, you've seen the, the the public polls here on Larry Hogan. He's he's uh, he's had some, some solid leads. Um, he has a maverick kind of brand as a, uh, a popular two-term Republican governor in the blue state, where Marylanders uh, they trust him. He's got a proven track record, and uh, Larry Hogan's is just a terrific candidate. He's he's uh, he's out there going everywhere in uh, in Maryland. If you're watching what Larry's doing, he's out there uh, pressing every every corner state for every vote, and. <clears throat> And Larry Hogan has a unique, unique brand. You know, he, he has been, uh, you know, he's, he clearly defined himself as he's not on trying to do what President Biden supports. He's also, you know, kind of pushed back on President Trump. He says, I'm Larry Hogan, I'm gonna do what's right for Maryland. And I'm not bound by either one of these presidents or candidates. And I think uh, in, in a state like Maryland, that's a great position to be in. And the uh, Marylanders, under, they know Larry Hogan. I mean, his, his, his favorability numbers, when we pulled it, were stronger when he got in the race than they were when he exited as governor of Maryland. Which is really some, I mean, that was, that, that surprised us, frankly, in the polls. Typically, you know, over time, after you leave office, is, I think Greg Walden once told me, uh, a former U.S. House member in Oregon, he says, there's nothing more former than a former member of Congress. And it's something in politics that's fleeting. And yet for Larry Hogan, he was actually stronger in his numbers when we polled at two different polls uh, when he was considering getting into that race with strong double-digit leads. And, and let's not forget, again, back to the, what Senator Van Hollen said, I mean, such a different dynamic. They've got a contentious primary right now for an open seat, so it's an open seat. Contentious primary on the left between Troner and also Brooks, which is neck and neck race. And so it's a very different uh, scenario than, for example, what Senator Van Hollen, when he compared my race against Steve Bullock in 2020. Um, John Gizzi from Newsmax. Thank you, Linda, and thanks for doing this, Senator. Um, one of the things that's come to light recently with the financial disclosure reports is that in all of the major contested dem uh, races for the Senate, Democrats are leading in fundraising at this point. And in particular, I point out, Every analysis I've read said Senator Cruz of Texas is the only incumbent Republican in the danger zone. And yet his opponent, a two-term House member, relatively unknown, is actually beating him in fundraising. What's the reason for this pattern? Well, um, we, we will never outraise the Democrats in fundraising. We, well, I mean, it, it is, you, you, when you go into a race as a Republican, you accept yeah. the fact that the Democrats are always going to raise more money than we will based on, from campaign to campaign. I mean, I, I get to look at my own race in Montana. I was crushed in terms of hard dollars versus Steve Bullock. It was an amazing amount of money that, that flowed into Montana. I mean, in, in a state that has three cows per person, we only have 1.1 <laughs> million people in Montana. And yet again, as I, as I said, that, that, that race turned into a, if, you, if this would have been in Florida, I told Marco Rubio, this would have been a two and a half billion dollar race in, in Florida. It kind of puts some sense of the magnitude. Um, it's no surprise that, uh, that Ted Cruz will be outraised in Texas because he's Ted Cruz. If these races nationalized, and there'll be a lot of money poured in to try to beat Ted Cruz. Not unlike what happened in Kentucky against Mitch McConnell. The, the money flowed in to try to beat Mitch McConnell. He's a, he's a national figure. What happened with Lindsey Graham last cycle of money, you know, they threw a huge amount of money. It didn't make any difference in South Carolina or Kentucky. And I don't think it's going to make any difference in Texas either. I mean, Ted is taking his race very seriously. He's working very hard. But look at your RCP average this morning in Texas. I think Ted's up, what, plus eight, plus nine round numbers? 
Uh, there's a recent poll that came out in the last 48 hours that actually had Ted extending a double-digit lead there in Texas. But the point is, um, you know, Ted, Ted is working very hard. Uh, he's going to be outspent, no doubt about it, and Ted Cruz is going to win Texas. I saw Schumer said they're going to win Texas. I mean, that sounds like Baghdad Bob, I mean, <laughs> back in the last yeah. war, in the Iraq war. I mean, really. I mean, if that's, if that's what Schumer's uh, line is going to be, they're going to win Texas, um, good luck. Daniel Strauss from CNN, to your left. Hi, Senator. <coughs> Thanks uh, for doing this today. So um, it's a timely CSM breakfast because uh, Politico has a story up today of Burgess interviewing uh, Leader McConnell. And yep. Leader McConnell says he's not counting his chickens before they've hatched. Yep. He's focused on four states. Mm -hmm. uh, I am wondering, related to this, there is this shadow that your predecessor had over um, 2022 where he expected he expected something like 55 seats yeah. and a 55 seat majority. Yeah. Uh, Leader McConnell in this interview is a little more small seat conservative. I'm wondering what realistically your number is for like what, what the real goal is, the realistic like majority at the end of the day. Is it 52 seats? Is it 53? Um, because, again, your predecessor was overly optimistic. 51. 51. That's all? Okay. Really? Why, why 51? Because that gives us the majority. <laughs> but you don't think that means that of the seven or eight seats that are really in play, probably won't win. I, I, I will let you all go through and analyze the races and decide what number you want to put on it. All I know is what matters the most is the majority. And 51 is what we're focused on. I mean, sorry. No, go ahead. Well, look, I, I mean, yeah, at the end of the day, modern American politics are slim margins. What, what, what do you think it's going to be? Alan okay. Said. To be clear, yeah. I am chronically bad. At <laughs> I thought Chris McDaniel would be a senator right now. Right? <laughs> so, um, you know, look, it, it strikes me that. You have your reach state Maryland, they have their reach state Texas. It's going to come down to one or two states Montana, uh, Ohio, which we haven't heard. I mean, these, these senators with, in red states with really strong brands. Yeah, yeah. And so 51 does sound reasonable. Well, I'm, that's, that's what we're focused on. Well, it's not lost on me looking at a lot of these races are on, are on the margin. They're razor-thin races. I mean, it's going to be a, a night that things can go either way in many of these states. But uh, 51 is, is our goal. And uh, you will not hear me from now until November 5th say anything but 51. But that is the majority. That, that is what uh, puts the gavel into the hands of the new Republican leader. Uh, and that's that's John. that's a goal. Is that John? <laughs> John, yeah. Right. Four years. <laughs> you, you I'm, fo I'm focused on winning the majority. Exactly. Ah, well, I am. No, it's it, got to get the majority. Right. So we have a majority leader even to talk about. Um, Juliana Schäuble from Tagesspiegel to your right. <clears throat> Thank you for doing this. Um, you said uh, inflation and migration on the border are yeah. the two most important issues. Yeah. But some Republicans say if the abortion issue wouldn't be on the table again, the, the chances would be much better to, to have good results. How, are you, how do you want to handle this, or how can you handle this, and what impact is it going to have on the election? Yeah, yeah, that's a great question. Um, you know, th I think as we look at the, you know, defining uh, the issue where our candidates will stand, it's, uh, we've talked about, as, as we've done you know, extensive work in, in polling, as well as uh, focus groups, particularly with, uh, with, with women and, and suburban women, voters that, uh, that, that rise to the issue, and single women is their, their most important issue. Um, what we've said is at first it's very important that uh, supporting the exceptions for rape, incest, and life of the mother. And then uh, supporting reasonable limits on late-term abortions, which the majority of the American people support that position. Like 15 weeks or 15 weeks? Yeah, I mean, late term, I'm in, uh, in Arizona, uh, Governor Hobbs is going to sign a 15-week um, bill probably this week as it just passed the uh, Arizona Senate yesterday and passed the Arizona House the week before. 
So you're going to have a Democrat a governor signing a 15-week uh, a law there, which has been called the pain capable. It's the point at which a uh, baby feels pain. But uh, that's, it, you know, late term, I'll let the candidates decide where that might be, but, uh, but you'll see a, a Democrat governor sign that bill here probably in the next few days. Just about, Ethan, how concerned are you about Florida, for example? How, how concerned about, are you about a law in Florida that has six weeks and might mobilize a lot of Look, ev every, to the other well, side? first of all, Rick Scott's going to be fine in Florida. Mm -hmm. um, he, uh, he's running a great race. And um, the polling there, well, well Ted's numbers are, are strong. Rick's are even stronger in Florida. Um, but, look, every, you know, both Ted Cruz and Rick Scott, Though they are solidly leading today in their races, they are running like they're five points behind, like you'd expect them to. That's always the advice you have. No matter how far ahead you are, if you're Jim Justice, you run like you're five points behind. And both Rick and Ted are doing the same thing. So, and uh, they're very in touch with their voters. Uh, Rick will will frame this the way that uh, that Florida wants to see him represent Florida. Same thing for Ted Cruz. So I'm just I'm just not concerned right now going on in Florida and, and it relates to Rick Scott's race. Mm -hmm. Or even as a national, I mean, Florida is a good platform for national exposure, right? You go to Florida and talk about choice with, given the local context. Yeah. It plays nationally. Yeah, it does, but it's it's the, the Florida race is not uh, going to rise to being one of the top competitive races in the country. All right. Um, yeah. I'm sorry. Your name is? Al Weaver. Oh, Al Weaver of the Hill. Thanks for doing this. Good to see you. Senior, it's in your son. It's seen this somewhere that is the hallway. So, um, yeah. Utah. I'm curious about the Utah Senate race. Uh, Brent Hatch didn't make the ballot the other day. Uh, couldn't get enough signatures. We didn't well enough in the convention. Um, curious where if you guys are going to play in that race. You know, John Curtis is uh, strongly in the primary at this point. It seems like some big money's flooding in. But um, curious if you guys uh, plan on making any moves there. So, fun fact, Al, that you probably haven't heard before, Orrin Hatch was a cousin of mine. Really? Yep. Now, I'm Presbyterian, I'm not LDS, not which that. is fine, but just so you know, um, <laughs> it was actually a cousin, so uh, sure. not, not that the, the family connections there had any support for, for Mr. Hatch there in Utah, but Orrin, Orrin and I were actually cousins, we go back a, a ways. It was, it was a long time ago, but uh, we, we shared uh, some common ancestors. Um, but no, we're, 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 we're staying out of the Utah race. I, if, uh, if Utah goes uh, Democrat, uh, <laughs> anybody oh. here predicting that one? Any of those, any those, any those candidates all? all yeah, I, it's, we're, we're staying at we'll, we'll let Utah, you know, we, again, um, overarching strategy of the NRSC, we're looking for candidates who can win a primary and a general. Any of those candidates in Utah can win the general election. All right. Um, to your left, Lissandra Villa, am I pronouncing your name right? Lisa. Lisa, Lisa Boston Globe. Yeah. Um, Senator, I also wanted to ask about abortion. How critical is it for Senate Republican candidates to have their messaging right on this in order for Republicans to win the Senate majority? Well, I, I think it is important. Uh, I think that's a lesson learned from 22, to get the messaging right, and also for our candidates to state where, where they stand on the issue. Uh, and so uh, I think it's important. That's why we've, we've made it clear in terms of uh, we've done extensive polling work, extensive focus group, focus group work here. Uh, in terms of positions, and to let each respective senator take the position that's right for their respective state. And I just, you know, just want a little pushback. I mean, I, I expect the abortion questions. I wish you'd ask every Democrat where they would draw a line, as well as to any limits on abortion. Just ask them, where would you draw any line for a taxpayer-funded abortion? And find out, so you know, push them like you push us. Just in terms of fairness on this issue, ask them where they stand. Yeah. I mean, I think you're already seeing it in, in most races right now. I mean, the, the, the voters want to talk about about the border. They want to talk about inflation. They want to talk about crime. Uh, that's top of mind issues. And versus every poll you take, the Republicans, Independents, and Democrats, that's where it lands. Even what about suburban women? Isn't that well? But that okay. Now you start taking a specific segment. Then you've got you know, your segment. But that's true of any issue set at any demographic. Mm -hmm. You're going to have specific issues there. 
But uh, again, I just, in fairness to the press, I wish you all would spend as much time asking Democrats where they would draw the line. Because they won't for a taxpayer-funded abortion. Ask them if they'd support any limits, any limits, for a taxpayer-funded abortion. You're gonna, you're gonna get taxpayer-funded abortion as many times as you said abortion. Yeah. And I just find that interesting. Is that what you're telling candidates? Is that what the no, talking point is? I'm not. That's, that's Steve Day speaking here this morning. Okay. But just, but just abortion. But leave the taxpayer part out. Just ask them. I mean, you, you all don't do that much. And I think it's important. Chief, uh, just yeah, go ahead. No, no, I, I, I'm not jumping the line. Sure. No, that's no, fine. Yeah, no, we'll, yeah, we'll, just in, in a few minutes. Um, Zach Cohen from Bloomberg, to your left. Chairman, thanks for hey, Zach, good to see you. Appreciate it. Yeah. Likewise. Um, you've obviously been very involved in recruiting for some of these races, especially where there's Democratic incumbent, places like Ohio, Montana. Um, can you talk a little bit about what sort of a due diligence ahead of recruiting some of these candidates like Bernie Moreno, Tim Sheehy, those that don't have a voting record but a business record, ahead of trying to get them into these uh, these nominations? Yeah, well, it's true, and I mentioned Cormac as well. I mean, look, we do, uh, you know, both sides, it's not lost, do extensive opposition research on candidates. Uh, and so we, we do the same due diligence, certainly. And uh, I mean, I, I remember when I thought about running uh, for the U.S. House, I mean, I, I stepped from the private sector. I had a business career. I've been in the private sector 28 years. I, I worked in China for six years for Procter & Gamble, launching brands over there. I mean, so when you, when you, when you develop, you do your own OPPO research on yourself. Uh, and uh, and you, so you prepare yourself for what you know are going to be attacks because uh, what we're finding is that the issues, the issues are difficult right now for the Democrats to attack on. And so you've got to pivot over to you know, whatever your business background and, and your personal, personal life. So we do extensive OPPO research. I did it on myself. And sure enough, when I was running for the U.S. Senate in 2020, um, the number one hit on me was my time in China. You know, no good <laughs> deed goes unpunished, as we did a lot of work here of, uh, of launching American brands to compete against the Chinese. We didn't outsource. We were, we were there to launch brands and build an American company presence there. But uh, it was the number one hit they had against me. They spent millions of dollars uh, on that. But we knew that was coming. All right. Uh, Amy Schwartz from Moment Magazine to your left. Mm -hmm. Senator, thanks, thanks, for, uh, thanks for doing this. You bet. Um, I'm, I'm curious whether you think the current wave of unrest on college campuses will play at all in the fall um, yeah. campaigns, or will it be over by then? And if it does play, then in what direction? Yeah, well, I, I think this is a, uh, politically speaking, I mean, let me, let me I, I want to, just before we get into the politics of this, just be clear, I mean, if you saw the the Republican leadership stakeout yesterday, or listen to it. Yeah, just maybe for, for background, um, Leader McConnell doesn't like call us and say, here's what we want to talk about, like the issue du jour. I mean, it, it's, it is kind of like open mic night at the bar. It's like whatever you want to say, no, nobody tells me what to say um, in terms of mm -hmm. my you know, two or three minutes in front of the, the press corps. Nobody tells Joe Neers or Shelley Capito or John Finn or John Barrasso or or the leader. We just all show up, and I sometimes am waiting to see, like, I wonder what Thune's going to say today. There was no coordination. And yesterday, every single one of us showed up with a full-throated condemnation on the anti-Semitism and the hate that's going on right now against the Jewish people across many university campuses. It's reprehensible what's happening. And that's why, see, what can be done? Well, one thing we could do is to, is to stop the federal funding. You know, Columbia had received $1.2 billion in federal funding last year. UCLA, nearly a billion dollars. I mean, you kind of go through, the Ivy Leagues are usually in the, nor well north of 500 to $700 million, not to mention all the philanthropy. And you're seeing now the philanthropists saying, we're gonna shut off donations they don't get this right. So um, I just want to make that clear. I think it's, and, and I'm, I, I wish we'd have maybe some Democrat join us with full-throated condemnation and taking action. So, so there's just I, I, one other point that I made that uh, got me pretty fired up yesterday. Yeah, these are the same elite institutions that, of course, promote diversity and inclusion. 
except if you are a Jewish student or a Jewish professor. That's hypocrisy. So that's just, I want to be clear on that. Now let's talk about the politics behind it. But I want to make sure it's clear on this is the moment we need moral clarity with what's going on in our campuses. It's, it's a dangerous moment in US history. And we must stand up firm with full-throated rebuke and condemnation of what's happening with the hate and the violence against these Jewish students and Jewish professors. Now, politically speaking, I think it's a problem for the Democrats. Uh, and whether or not that still is going to be a, a, a major issue in the fall remains to be seen to see if this resolves or not. Uh, we'll wait and see. But at this moment, um, you're seeing clarity and you're seeing the American people here are siding where we're at on this is they're just appalled by these images continue on and I think we'll see what happens as we close the fall if, if, if this could be a big problem for the Democrats in August in Chicago uh, but I'm guessing these same students that are pretty fired up right now on the campuses in May remember they're, they're gonna be taking finals and going home here pretty soon they'll be coming back in the fall this could be a problem for the Democrats politically speaking but, but I want to say this, I mean, I, we, I know this is a political discussion. I want to make sure I was very clear where I stand just in terms of personally my views on the anti-Semitism going on in the country. And I don't care if Republican, Democrat, Independent, Libertarian, we must have full condemnation of what's happening at this moment in history. Um, mm -hmm. Jonathan Nicholson from HuffPost. <coughs> Thank you for doing this. Yeah. Um, <coughs> speaking of moral clarity, uh, something that Democrats have been very vocal on um, has been Russia. Um, and taking help in Ukraine in their fight against mm -hmm. Russia. Um, and obviously some members of your party um, are, to put it politely, Ukraine skeptical. Um, mm -hmm. Others are, uh, are, are, are very much uh, to the right of that. Um, and it's to the point where Democrats feel comfortable saying things like the pro-Putin caucus. Um, <clears throat> do you feel you have the, uh, a problem with this idea of, of that Republicans, uh, or at least some segment, are sympathetic toward Russia or Putin? Um, and do you worry anything about losing sort of like the um, ancestral vestigial Reagan Republicans who grew up knowing Russia was bad? Yeah. Well, I think you know, the pro-Putin thing is uh, is Democrat spin. Um, but look 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 at the strong vote the supplemental received last week, including myself supporting it. It was, it was a strong bipartisan and frankly a strong majority of the Republicans as well who supported it. I think there's fair questions about what the clear objectives are in Ukraine. I mean, if there's been a critique of the Biden administration is they've been kind of on their heels, including Secretary Blinken, of not leaning in early on with lethal aid, lethal force. Remember we have those fights about fighter jets and type of missile systems and so forth and the, the <coughs> administration didn't want to escalate. Well, look, if you want to see escalation, or let me say this, if you want to avoid escalation of this conflict, you want to make sure that Putin never crosses an Article 5 red line with NATO. And that's why it's important that, uh, that he does not win in Ukraine. Um, I think it is fair to ask, what are the objectives at this moment of time for Ukraine? What's the end game here? That's a fair question that needs to be an answer for the American people <coughs> and the taxpayers. But again, back to the notion that somehow the problem of pro-Putin is nonsense. Um, I think it's fair to ask how the money's being spent to make sure it's being spent smartly. And there's clear objectives to resolve a conflict in Ukraine. Do you worry though there's political exposure for you guys on this though, that the, that, that narrative will catch on given things like what J.D. Matt says? No, again, I mean, you saw a strong bipartisan, but also a strong Republican vote on that package. So I'm not, I'm not concerned about it. It's look, every senator is entitled to opinions, and I respect that of each one of my fellow, my colleagues. But you know, we saw a strong vote last week. Mm -hmm. um, okay, Mark Kuski from Polish Radio, speaking of Ukraine. Yeah, you said that, and it's obvious that uh, such issues as uh, economy, inflation border are the most important uh, in senatorial campaigns, but I'm wondering how foreign policy 
plays out uh, in the campaign, uh, whether such as issues as uh, Ukraine, NATO, uh, can play out somehow, it can be important in, uh, in the races. Yeah. And if so, where? Yeah. We say. Well, I think it's the American people know well that they're electing the commander in chief starting at the top of the ticket. And they are looking at the comparison, not unlike we saw happen, I think, in 1980. I think many in this room remember the late 70s. Some of you don't. Um, but I do. Um, I, was, uh, I was in high school. Um, and um, I remember it well. Uh, the first president I got to vote for was, uh, was Ronald Reagan. I was 18 years old in the fall of 1980. And coming into that election, you know, there's, there's some, there are some similarities of the inflation that was going on in the economy, the uh, geopolitical unrest, the weakness of Jimmy Carter in the Oval Office. And remember, we had hostages held in the embassy in Tehran at that moment. And it compared a, a weak president in Carter to the peace through strength position of Ronald Reagan, and uh, it was a pretty telling night in November of 1980 in the outcome. I, I think uh, geopolitics will be a factor for the American people. If you remember President Biden and the Democrats said, if you elect President Trump in 2020, where there's going to be war with Iran, I mean, it, it's pretty telling that when President Trump was in office, the Iranians hadn't attacked. They had not attacked Israel. That was unprecedented first time in terms of a full-scale massive attack. Now, they've done it through their proxies of Hezbollah, Hamas, and the Houthis, but not in terms of, of a full-on assault, not to mention the largest terror attack in the history of Israel occurred, of course, on October 7th. Putin hadn't invaded Ukraine under Trump's watch, but it did under Biden's watch. So I think the American people are stepping back and, and they see and they're concerned that a weak president is a dangerous moment as it relates to world history. It is back to Ronald Reagan of peace through strength. It's deterrence. You have deterrence through a strong president. President Biden is weak. He has the worst numbers of you see him reported of any president in 70 years. Uh, this is a major liability for uh, the president and particularly for the, the Senate races down ballot where every, you know, in, in every state we're going to be competing here in, the, in these blue states, uh, in the blue wall, I should say, that they call it, but actually I think that's, it has shit, uh, it can go either way, these swing states, I should say, our candidates will embrace President Trump coming to their states. The Democrats are going to have to make a really tough decision. Do I want to be seen on the stage with Joe Biden or not? So how's your relationship with John Tester these days, given that you're trying to get him fired? Oh, we, we get along just fine as two Montana guys. Um, I, I do kind of recall maybe back in 2020, he tried to get me fired, maybe. Just maybe <laughs> that's lost to anybody here, but that's, that's, just, that's just the way it goes. You know, in, in, in Montana, when we think about it, um, if you're playing in sports, if you got a, you're in a high school football team, you're wearing one color jersey and your opponent's the other color jersey on the field. You know you're, you're taking, you know, hits against each other. That's all part of it. But after the game, you say good game and you move on. And that's the way my relationship is with John Tester. We're two Montana guys who uh, who get along. We vote very differently. Mm -hmm. If you look at our voting records, um, it's almost sometimes as if there's two different states represented. Truly, if you look at it, uh, John Tester's voting record is 95% with Joe Biden. That's something that um, uh, John Tester had to run away from in Montana. And uh, I'm pretty sure by the time we get to November that Montanans will at least have a very clear view of what his voting record's been like. Mm. Um, let's see, woman in the blue dress. I, I'm sorry, I don't know. Uh, Bridget Bowman with MPP. Oh, Bridget Bowman. Yeah. Um, I just wanted to follow up quickly on um, something you had said earlier about abortion. You yeah. had mentioned it's important to support exceptions and reasonable late term yeah. limits on late term abortions. Yeah. Does that, do you advise candidates to reject a national federal ban on abortion? Yeah, so um, the, 
the, the lies that have been told is that, that the Republicans support a federal ban on all abortions. That's really what they're messaging on that. That's the, that's the scare tactic going on that. Um, and we are advising our candidates, first of all, to, to take a position on abortion that best matches the state they represent. That's what we're telling our candidates. And we'll let them decide where they're going to stand on it. But we know that uh, be clear on the exceptions of rape, incest, life of the mother, and make the point that uh, most Americans believe we should have reasonable limits on late-term abortions. Um, and then at the very end, the woman, yes, uh, yeah, what's Allie your name? Mutnick. Allie Mutnick. Oh, right, right. Allie Mutnick. Um, I wanted to ask a follow-up question on the McCall interview that mm -hmm. Brandon Plagg said. Yeah. He said right now he sees four states for sure in play, Montana, Ohio, Maryland, Pennsylvania. Mm -hmm. Would you agree with that assessment? Um, though, though, say the four again, you said it was beyond West Virginia, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. beyond West Virginia. Right, so, so first of all, you know, West Virginia, um, I'm a conservative forecaster, as you probably heard. Um, but, you know, West Virginia's over. So that takes us to 50-50. Um, so we need to win one more state out of, I'd argue there's eight states right now that are, uh, that are gonna be competitive Senate races. Um, I think I would add uh, Michigan, certainly, to that list as an open seat. You just kind of look at if you've got a stack rank it. Um, certainly, you take a look at like Wisconsin. We had Eric Hubde here uh, last night. Uh, that race is closing as we speak. Uh, we know Wisconsin is going to be one of those razor edge states. It's a razor edge for the presidency. It'll be a razor edge for the Senate race. You know, Ron Johnson won by one point uh, last cycle. Uh, and then I think you look at Nevada as well. Uh, that's, again, a state where, if you look at the demographics, like Montana, you know, if, you, if you look at Montana for a moment, if I could just point out the quantitative look, you know, John Tester beat Matt Rosendale by 18,000 votes in 2018. There have been more than 18,000 net center-right voters moved to Montana since 2018. I mean, my hometown of Bozeman, where I went to kindergarten through college, has been the fastest growing micropolitan in America for four consecutive years. This influx of voters have been, as we say, we call them refugees, not missionaries. They're fleeing the blue states of California, Oregon, Washington, even Colorado. They're moving to Montana for the quality of life we have, it's unmatched, but also the quality of leadership we have. They, they want to be in a state where there's more similar kind of leadership to their values. Nevada, by the way, we looked at the numbers too, by a two to one margin, net new Californians moving to Montana, because in Montana you don't register by party. 31 states you register by party, 19 states you don't. Montana is one of the states you don't register by party. California is one you do. So we can look at the California roles. These newly minted Montanans, they're still driving their, their, their California cars. Two to one, they're Republicans, registered Republicans. So in Nevada, um, we are seeing a similar kind of migration this time, uh, leaving the craziness of California. And so that's why I also put Nevada there, certainly, as a state to watch. And Arizona, certainly, is toss-up right now. I mean, you can look at every poll in Arizona, there'll be three polls that have Kerry Lake ahead, three polls that have Gallego ahead, and one poll that has not dead tie. So I think there's a number of states there that are going to be, you know, the kind of toss-up category right now. Can I yeah, go ahead. And, and who are you? Uh, Reese Borman, David. Oh, right. but, by the way, one other state to keep an eye on is New Mexico. Um, I, you know, uh, we, 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 worked, we worked hard to recruit a candidate that could win a primary in a general, and that's Nella Domenici. I mean, her, her father was the longest serving senator in the history of New Mexico. Uh, Nella, you know, was Georgetown, Harvard, very successful businesswoman. Uh, and she is, uh, she's running a great campaign. Heinrich raised one and a half million dollars. You know, the one exception so far in the craziness of the fundraising for the Democrats has been Martin Heinrich. He only raised one and a half million dollars in Q1. Nella raised 1.2 million. So it's a race to keep an eye on. I mean, clearly, that's kind of where the map starts to reach. 
But Nell is running a great race. Just follow up on yeah. Arizona. Um, there's a Washington Post story earlier, I think this week or late last week, about Kerry Lake and how people in Trump, around Trump, Trump thinking that Kerry Lake could drag him down the ballot, that she doesn't necessarily have a chance. Obviously, she's said multiple things about this 1864 abortion ban coming out strong against it when it was first ruled by the court, and then earlier giving an interview to this local newspaper saying that she wants these people to enforce the 1864 abortion ban. Is there concerns around Carrie Lake and her ability to win in Arizona? So Carrie is a very talented, very smart, very articulate candidate um, who lost narrowly, you know, in 2022 for governor. It was a, you know, very, very narrow loss. Um, I, I look at it quantitatively. If Kerry uh, versus Gallego, remember Gallego, there, there's a lot of, you know, there's a lot of focus by the press on on um, on Kerry Lake. I kind of wish there'd be equal attention placed to Ruben Gallego, who has uh, an opposition research file that uh, is one of the more interesting ones of all the files we have. Um, but just quantitatively right now in that race, uh, it's Every poll I see is margin of error right now. I see a few that have carry up, a few that have Gallego up, one literally <clears throat> dead heat tied, but within margin. And the, the, the key to Kerry Lake's path to victory in Arizona as a border state will be talk about the border, talk about inflation, talk about crime, talk about what the Mexican cartels are doing uh, on the southern border. She was handling those issues. And by the way, you know, she was very helpful and instrumental in getting the, the Arizona House and the Arizona Senate to, to get that 15-week bill that Governor Ducey had signed into law prior that Governor Hobbs is going to sign into law in the next few days. She was instrumental in getting, making that happen, and, and um, she was to, to her credit. Mm. Um, Isabella Murray from ABC across the table. Thanks for doing this. Mm -hmm. So on, on Arizona um, and Trump yesterday in, in Wisconsin and kind of said, didn't commit to kind of accepting the results of the election in, in 24 and, and Carrie Lake has, I still I don't think has conceded her, her governor's race um, in 22. What is the NRSC's posture on, um, on you know, election? the election in 24, if Carrie Lake doesn't, you know, accept the results of her, um, of her Senate race, how will you all respond to that? Um, and what have, what's been the guidance, you know, to her or conversations with her around that? Well, just, oh, I'll tell you what the, the guidance is in looking back on 22, is that it's clear voters care most about inflation, the border, and crime. They want our candidates to talk about what they're going to do to address their pocketbook issues, pocketbook issues, and, and uh, you know their uh, their own personal safety. I mean, the, the the worries right now, what's happening in terms of crime and drugs flooding into these every state in the country that ties back to the southern border. That's the issues that the voters care most about. They care more about looking forward and less about you know, past elections or grievances. And uh, that, that's going to be key for Carrie, and just to look forward. And uh, with the, it, she's got a, a winning message there. But if thing. she doesn't, you know, accept the results in 24, uh, you know, she's someone you, you've all endorsed, what, what will the NRSC kind of, what would, would the position be there? Well, it's, it's like, I mean, what, what do you think? I mean, you look at the data. You look at, if, the, if, there, if there is legitimate claims that, that uh, you know, we can look at it, uh, but I don't, uh, you're going to let the Secretary of State, will let the states certify these elections, and if there's irregularities, it's something you look at, no matter if you're Republican or Democrat. I mean, Democrats do that, Republicans do that. I mean, I had, I had lawyers ready to go in Montana in 2020 because we thought we were going to have a really close race. Thankfully, we didn't. You're always going to watch what's going to happen there, if there's any problems there to, to challenge in the courts. But. Um, that's, we'll wait and see what happens in 24, but uh, I mean, I, you look at, you look at me, if, if, it, if it comes down to four or five votes or something, and it's, I mean, look what happened in Florida back with, uh, with Bush. Yeah, I mean, you hope and pray elections don't going to get that close. Was that a conversation you had with her before you endorsed about when is the appropriate time to 
contested election? No. But I mean, there is, look, be clear, there's appropriate times to contest results on both sides. It's been that in the case since the beginning of time, you know, but it's, uh, uh, I, I just know that right now Arizonans want to move ahead and focus on the future, not the past. Mm -hmm. yeah, do you have, uh, uh, sort of following up a little bit on Zach's question, you were very successful in recruiting very successful business people to run states like Montana, Pennsylvania, and Wisconsin. You've got people who can self-fund to some degree, but they are getting these attacks about their investments in China, about uh, being recent residents of the state, having houses in other states, businesses in other states. Do you have sort of advice for them as they're an outsider making that pivot from the business community to being a politician, going right for the Senate, and not going for other seats first? How do they make that transition? Is it an advantage in this year compared to other years? Sort of like, how do you guys view, because there's several people with this kind of an issue where they're facing statements that they made that may be in politic or investments that don't look great on a 30-second ad, uh, or they have a lot of wealth, private jet travel, big houses in other states. I mean, if you want to go back and forth on the Apple research that we have on the Democrat candidates, happy to do that, but probably not the place to do it. Um, I've got a long list, every one of those races that we're going to enjoy litigating in front of the people back in the respective states. But look, I, I've been in that same position. I did not have a voting record. We don't have a voting record. They come and attack you on everything you've ever done in your life. And that's just, it's, it's, uh, there's deep opposition research files on both sides. That's no surprise to anybody in this room. And that'll be litigated in front of the American people. But I will tell you, there's, uh, there's not a lot of happiness with the American people with a lot of incumbents in Washington. And so this outsider view to change what's going on here just starts as a pretty appealing position in bio in most cases. Do we want to have people who have who don't have any experience in the private sector? I hope not, I had it. I think it's it's part of the mix we need to have in Washington. Not that it's the only kind of bio to have, it was my bio. And I think it, it helps in terms of the blend of the, you know, the diversity we have in, in our government to have those perspectives of those who didn't have a career in politics. Uh, I mean, Sheriff Brown was, was elected when Nixon was president. It goes back a ways. All right. We're it's 9.32, I promised your team we would end All right, that went, that went on way too fast. So, <laughs> oh good, we'll come back. <laughs> All right. Thank you, appreciate it, you bet. Yes, thank you. Thank you so yeah, much. Yeah, thanks, you bet, thank you so much.